Hey folks, this is Pastor Buddy with the uh, Pastor's Bible Study, and we're here getting ready to start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse, uh, 11, uh, verse 11. And uh, you were just asking, uh, her uh, her hip is doing better, and she was walking this past week without a walker. Good. So yeah. Good. Um, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time and your word. We pray that you will bless it according to who you are. For it's in Jesus' name we pray this in all things. Amen. Amen. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. This is verse 11 of chapter 11. We have already talked about how Abraham has, uh, by faith, when he was called out to go to a place when he should receive after an inheritance, he obeyed, he went out. That was back in uh, verse 8. And verse 9, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. And 9, he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And now in verse 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Now remember when she found out she was going to be pregnant, she laughed. And God said, why did Sarah laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. Said, oh yes, she did. Oh yes, she did. And, uh, and he called her out for it. But uh, in fact, the name of her child, Isaac, is uh, Hebrew for laughter. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you imagine? Hey, what's your name? Laughter Hoggard? Because <laughs> that's essentially what his name was in Hebrew, you know, without the last name. But, uh, <clears throat> and she delivered of a child when she was a past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Hey, so she, uh, you know, if any woman knows when she's past age to have a child, a woman, the woman does. And, of course, that means she is no longer having her, uh, her cycle every month and, and had passed that age. She'd gone through uh, menopause. And, uh, and uh, and so that's why, why why wouldn't she laugh when she finds out that she's going to have a child because you know once that's done you don't you can't have a baby anymore and yet uh, what does God do He says uh, she's going to have a baby in Genesis 18 it's, I think it's 18:45 it says is anything too hard for God it's not. absolutely I not wasn't supposed to have any children yep Hebrews chapter 11 physically impossible verse yep. verse Verse 11. Okay. Yep, 11, 11. Okay. And we just read that one, getting ready to go into 12. Okay. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as she stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Isaac being born of a dead womb is a shadow of Jesus coming out of a tomb. Oh, I had not thought of that. Yeah. Awesome. The womb was dead. There was no more chance of having children. And yet Isaac was born out of a dead womb. When Jesus uh, died on the cross and he was buried, everybody said there's no way he's coming out of there. Just like they said there's no way Sarah's going to have a child. Was she like 93? She was 90. 90. Yeah. yeah. Ain't none of us 90 yet in this room anyway. No. I, 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 I know Miss D. Ford, she's 90, and she'll tell you she ain't going to have no baby. No. <laughs> no. I mean, can you imagine somebody walking up to her and saying, "I'm, uh, you're going to have a young kid. <laughs> she'd probably get, she'd probably have a good laugh too. I mean, you may as well walk up to me and say, "I'm gonna have a young one." Uh huh. Yeah. I wouldn't laugh because I'd be scared it might happen, and then I, oh no. Because <clears throat> once God gets involved, oh no. Uh, let's see. I already got people on here saying, "Keep losing you again." I hope not. But I've got. I'm. Uh, I'm also taping it, so if we do lose y'all tonight again, I'm gonna. I'm gonna post it on Rumble, and and hopefully we'll be able to get this thing squared away. If not, uh, we may have to stop doing. Uh, Facebook and I'll just post on here when it's when it's posted but I know I know you guys on Facebook like posting your questions and uh, letting me know that you're here and stuff so okay. hopefully this will work out hmm? What's Rumble? Uh, YouTube and Rumble. Rumble uh, Rumble's like YouTube just more conservative well actually I'm not sure if it's more conservative they just don't cut you out if you are conservative. Oh I never heard of that. YouTube uh, during COVID and all that kind of stuff they were shutting down people if they said anything about the vaccination or or spoke anything positive about the our, our last president, current president, last president. <laughs> yep, it's saying trying to connect. Oh my gracious, re trying to reconnect. I don't know what the deal is. It's the same phone, the same building, but we're having having issues with it. Uh, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. And of course, I just read that a little while ago. So many as the stars of the sky, the one who came out of a dead womb, uh, his children were going to number like the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea, the children of Israel. 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, <clears throat> go back prior to May of 1948. Because people were complaining and griping and arguing that the Bible's not true because God didn't keep his promise. Because he said that he was going to call out all of his children from the four corners of the earth. Prior to May of 1948, people didn't see it come to pass. So they thought it was a false prophecy. But then it happened. Israel became a nation again, who had not been a nation since 70 AD. Well, let's go back further. They hadn't really truly been a nation since uh, 586 BC when they were taken over by Babylon and then by Medo-Persia and then by Greece and then, uh, and then Syria. So uh, they hadn't, uh, uh, I'm sorry, by, yeah, Romans. by the Romans, yeah. So they, uh, they haven't really been a nation since Babylon took over. You can't really call yourself a true nation if you can't instill uh, capital punishment. And they had to have permission even to kill Jesus. They had to go before the Romans to do it. Which blows my mind because there was a bunch of times they didn't go to the Romans and they were looking to stone him to death. And he would make himself invisible, pass through him, all those kind of things. But in that particular time there with the, with the Sanhedrin involved, they decided to go ahead and do everything according to the law and went before uh, the uh, Roman uh, pontiff Pilate. And uh, we're, in, uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 11 and I uh, just read verse 13. <clears throat> but they all died in faith not having received the promises yet in other words Jesus told them everything that was going to happen but this was right before he was received up to the father and of course a lot of them died and even Paul answered some of their questions when he talked to the Thessalonians when he said uh, I would not have you be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow as others which have no hope and he tells them about the death burial and resurrection of the Jesus Christ and how if we believe on that, if we have that hope, if we have that joy, then we will uh, meet him in the air when he steps down out of heaven with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and receives his church unto himself. <clears throat> they hadn't seen that yet. We still haven't seen the rapture, but we've seen Israel come back together. We've seen, uh, 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 we've seen people getting saved, but we've seen the stuff that Jesus talked about 2,000 years ago come to pass up to this point may of 1948 culminating in a whole lot of stuff that was making a lot of people walk away from scripture because he said wait a minute if this doesn't happen none of the rest of it makes any sense and they're right but it just hadn't happened yet uh, you know problem today is that everybody wants to count on uh on the, on, the, on the love of God and the promises of God, but we've forgotten about the warnings of God. And forgetting about the warnings of God, we forget about some one of his greatest promises when he said, I'm coming back. You know, many of us don't live like he's coming back. We just think, well, he's been gone, he's been gone, he's just taking his time, sweet time. Peter talked about that 2,000 years ago. He said, people are just living like, you know, they've been coming and going, coming and going. What's the big deal? God hasn't come back yet. One day he's going to come back and it's going to be all those people left behind. So, uh, they had all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. In other words, going back to verse 1, faith, the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not yet seen. They had seen them afar off because they had faith in God keeping his promise. And when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. The thing is, keeping the faith that he's going to do it. Because a lot of people, yeah, I believe, yeah, I believe, yeah, I believe. And, and you think that person got saved and they're going to meet him in heaven. You know, but one of the things I remember Billy Graham saying one time, he says, I think a lot of us are going to be surprised who we don't see in heaven. And we're also going to be surprised who we see in heaven. Because there's a lot of, you know, when Paul talked about running the race, you run a race to complete it. But a lot of people start running the race and never finish it because they, they become like the seeds of the sower who are cast onto the walkway or into rocky ground or into uh, where they're uh, choked out by the, by the weeds and the thorns and things like that. They're not always cast onto the ground. It's been really plowed up good and fertilized and watered and stuff like that. But even if they're cast into that ground, they can succeed 
if they stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, uh, like this thing's done giving up on him. What's that? Like the sunflower in the sidewalk. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to go ahead and reset this thing to go ahead and start again. I may have to start doing something different in here. I don't know why this isn't picking up, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I'll just leave this one alone and I'll go ahead and post this later on and, uh, leave a, a link on this one for him to click on that one and watch it. <clears throat> See, this is all the stuff y'all have to deal with if we do that. <laughs> so, they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth, which we are. We're not of this world. When you get saved, you are no longer of this world. We're ambassadors of God, and when you're an ambassador, you're not allowed to act on your own. You have to act according to the person that, who sent you there. You know, like when, when our military goes overseas, if they do something wrong, they're not only going to be in trouble where they're at, but they're going to be in trouble here in the United States because they did something that was unlawful. When, when we go out in, in the name of Jesus Christ and do something that's unlawful in that nation, it's not only unlawful there, but we've done something wrong before the eyes of God, and we've got to pay for it. You know, people say, you know, well, being a pastor, you, you're going to have a great time in heaven. You're going to be able to, you already got your, your, check, your check on that box. I'm like, dude, do you realize how much more responsibility I have because I answered this call? You know, people hold me in a whole lot higher uh, light than they do any other person. I'm just a man of like passions like anybody else. You know, I tell people, don't put me on a pedestal. Put me on your prayer list. Because there's so many, so many things. It's not that I live according to a bunch of rules. It's just that, you know, not only am I looking to please God, but in pleasing God, I also look to making sure that I don't do anything that has the appearance of evil. Which all Christians are supposed to do, but particularly your pastor. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't know what the truth is. They really don't. I mean, I see these, these churches where the pastor runs off with somebody else's wife, and then he goes before the church and he apologizes for it, and they say, well, that's okay, we'll forgive you, because that's what we're supposed to do. We still want you to be our pastor. He knew, he's, no longer, he's no longer available to be a pastor anymore. What he did disqualified him for that office. Now, if he, now he can still be a Christian. He can ask forgiveness, and Jesus will forgive him, but he's disqualified himself because now he no longer has a, a good report among those who are without the church because those who are out the, without the church are looking at this stuff, and they're saying, uh-huh, yeah, see, I told you. They're no different than the rest of it. Look at it. They just took him right back, and then some people say, well, if they didn't take him back, it's because they don't love him. No, they're just following the Word of God. If you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it tells you exactly what the qualifications are. And yet we'll try to forget this because we're supposed to live. We're supposed to walk in love. We're supposed to walk in love. Yeah, we're supposed to walk in love. But we're also supposed to walk according to the precepts that God gives us. And if God gives us specific precepts on how to do certain things in his church, we're supposed to follow them. Just ignoring his word doesn't make us full of love. It makes us idiots. Literally, it makes us ignorant because we're not following. Actually, it doesn't make us ignorant. You're ignorant if you don't know any better. It makes us stupid. You know, ignorance is when you don't know any better. Stupidity is when you know better and you still do the wrong thing. And I know that doesn't make a lot of people feel good, but, you know, I'm talking to myself, too. If I openly do something that's wrong, you know, I've done things. When I first became pastor here and I would moderate business meetings, you know, I'd make some of the dumbest decisions. And I'd go back and look at things and I'd say, I can't do that. And I'd go before the church and I'd let them know. I see that, that decision we made last time, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do that. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, well, this decision right here, that's contrary to our bylaws. We need to go back and fix this. Because even though the church took a vote on it, we had no business voting on it. They said, what are you talking about? Okay, let's say uh, somebody comes up at our next business meeting and says, I vote that we go ahead and uh, build a building out front over here for, for our, our whatever so we can serve drinks to the bicyclists when they drive by and practice for the races. Somebody says, I second it. We go ahead and have a vote. How much is it going to cost? How much do you think it's going to cost? $50,000. I vote we go ahead and I motion we go ahead and spend $50,000 on that building. I second it. You know what we just did? We bypassed our building grounds and we bypassed our stewardship team. When something like that comes up as a moderator, people say, oh, you're just full of rules now. No, I'm just following our Constitution bylaws. 
If something like that comes up, I'm supposed to refer that back to our building and grounds and our stewardship team. Building the grounds is going to look and see what we need to build. Then they're going to come before the stewardship team and say, hey, look, this is what it's going to cost to build this thing. Do we have enough money to do this? If we do, let's bring it before the church so the church can vote on it. You don't just bring that stuff up in the middle of a business meeting and just vote on it. And we've done that in the past. And I've had to rank. You know, people came up to me one time and says, uh, Pastor, I had to bury this person over here in the graveyard. Can we go ahead and put a headstone up there? I don't see any problem with it. There's other headstones up there. And then I read our by Constitution bylaws. Oh, uh, the church voted no more headstones can go out there. There's actually in our Constitution bylaws that now that there's set up, even in the section that's got headstones, can't have them. Now, you know when I got reminded of that? When I told somebody they could go ahead and do it because there was already headstones out there, somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, I know you're trying to make them feel good and everything, but right here it says, man, why didn't you bring that to my attention before? I thought you knew. And, you know, people looking, looking at this online or something might be saying, you know, that's just mean. Why can't you just go ahead and make those decisions? you got to look at what the rules are in our Constitution bylaw. See, as pastor, I not only have the Word of God here, but I've also got this where the church has voted on what we're going to be governed by. And if we're not going to be using these, using these things, we need to just go ahead and get rid of them. You know, we had issues years ago. It's been nine years ago where people uh, left the church to go out and start another church. And they said, well, we're going to go ahead and do this, but we're still going to come to church on Sunday morning. Well, fine. Well, they started doing other things with the other church, and they stopped coming on Sunday morning, and then they got upset with me, and I said, well, you can't work on Wanda's anymore. Why not? Because you're not a regular attender. Well, I'm going to church. Yeah, but you're not coming to this church. And if I'm going if I'm, if I'm to apply these rules to these folks, I have to apply them to you. And people say, well, what's a regular attender? I said, what do you think a regular attender is? Somebody who regularly comes to church. You know, if you're going to say, well, I don't have to come two Sundays a month, well, that's only two Sundays a month you're coming. You think that's regular? I used to be a regular attender of church before I went to before I became a pastor. I might have missed four Sundays the entire year. And that's with 80 hours of overtime every two weeks. I'm not bragging on what I did, but I was serious about fellowshipping with other like-minded believers. You know, when I was going to Great Bridge Baptist Church, when I was going to Norview Baptist Church, I lived 30 miles away from Norview Baptist Church five years at a time I was going there. More than five years. Let's see, we started going to Great Bridge in 89, and I got saved in 84. We moved here in 83. And I was there every time the doors opened. Sundays, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night for visitation, Wednesday night for, for Bible study, sometimes Thursday night for discipleship training. You know, what I'd do is I'd go ahead and set up with somebody in Norfolk. I'd go ahead and bring a change of clothes with me. I could go to their house, take a shower, get my new, my, my, my clean clothes on, and go to church and go ahead and head up a discipleship study. You know, and, and people say, well, pastor, you just don't understand. You're, because you're pastor, you think people are supposed to be at church all the time. No, I thought that way before, long before I became a pastor. I didn't become a pastor until 2007. I got saved in 1984. Now, I, I, don't, I didn't do anything to prove anything to y'all after I had my surgery. But the following Sunday after I had my surgery on my foot, I'm getting up and said, Jerry, I need some clothes. I need, what do you need all that for? You've already got somebody to fill the pulpit. I said, I don't care. I want to go to church. <laughs> and it blew her mind because she thought I was going to be in too much pain. I wasn't in pain until I hurt myself two weeks later when I broke my cast. <laughs> I was in good shape until then. But I just love being at church. You know, it's not just because I'm pastor here. I love being around like-minded believers Amen. and the bible says you're not supposed to forsake the assembling of yourselves together you know i understand it says where two or more people are gathered together so shall he be but i got news for you he's there with just me but it just it's just i mean even talking to you on the phone you know you called me up the other day and i just you know i look up there whenever y'all call me up if you're in my uh, phone your face pops up there because when i'm driving and I've got you, you know, you're not supposed to mess with your phone when you're driving, but I put it up on the thing there, and I got the, the Bluetooth, so it doesn't matter. It's like talking to somebody on the phone on the, in a, on the seat next to me. But I got I got bifocals here. You can't tell because they're new line. But I'm doing this and doing all this kind of stuff <laughs> and trying to see out the mirrors, the windows, and the front windshield, and the back windshield. And so I just look over there, and I see your face, and I just press on it and, it, and that answers it. I looked over there, and I saw Rob. I said, oh, cool, this Rob. Because I look forward to talking to you guys. I really do. You know, it's not, I know some people probably see my name on there like, oh, no, I'm getting called to the office. No, it's not always like that. <laughs> I remember one time during VBS, I asked one of I said, 
hey, can you come over to my office a minute? And I got in my office and they come walking and all this. What's the matter? I said, what I do wrong? I said, you didn't do anything wrong. I just wanted to let you know how good it is. Well, I, I thought I'd done something wrong. I don't know why in the world they feel like that just because I'm pastor. It's just, yeah. <laughs> is there something know. we need to talk about if you're worried about me calling you in? <laughs> but, you know, it's just, and I know I've gone off, you know, I've gone off on a rabbit hunt and all that kind of stuff, but it's just, I really, I really love being at church. You know, we, we left out of here like six o'clock one night. We didn't have one us that night. We we stayed here and we worked on the blinds and, and me and Billy and Amy and Jerry just had a wonderful time fellowshipping together. And, and before we looked at it, I said, man, it's, it's almost it's almost seven o'clock. None of us realized it got that long because we just had a good time working together. Just just enjoyed being around each other. And uh, and that's the way it is with, with a lot of folks in the church. I just love doing that. You know, when, when people tell me, he says, so I have to be at church how many times a month? I think there's something going on when a person feels that way about coming to church. I mean, if, if you really feel that way about coming to church, maybe you need to stop or maybe you need to find the one that you like going to. You know, I have one, had one guy one told me, he says, you need to find another church. I said, well, I work here, so it'd be easier for you to find one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, unlike yourself, I'm not a church hopper. I've only been a member of three churches. And the first one I got saved in, the one I moved my membership to when I moved to Chesapeake, and the one I got called to after I got called to be a pastor. Yeah, it, it, a lot of people would ask me to go ahead and find another church. They've already joined 15, 20 churches already. I don't, know, I don't understand that a bit. Either find a church and stick with it or I don't know. I don't know. But they, 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 act, like they, they act like church is a buffet. They're going to pick, 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 and find something they don't like on it, they just leave. Yeah, I tell people, I say, why don't you go ahead and treat church like you treat your favorite restaurant? You, know, you wouldn't quit going there just because they messed up your steak one time. But if they have a bad day. There was a story about a lady one time. She says, I, you know, Pastor, I, I want to let you know this is going to be my last Sunday here. And he says, really? He says, is there anything I've done? He says, no, nah, no. Nah. It's just, you know, God is sick to me. He's just, he's always just, just bugs me to death. He said, why don't you find another seat to sit in? He said, well, I've been sitting there all my life. I'm not going to move my seat for him. Well, <laughs> well what else is going on? He said, and that's why you're going to leave here? Well, you know, sometimes the kids come in here and they just, parents don't keep them quiet. He said, well, don't you enjoy the sound of kids being in church? No, I want to hear what you're preaching on. He said, well, sorry you feel that way. He says, uh, can you do me a favor before you leave? She said, what's that? I said, can you go get you a glass of water, a cup of water, and fill it all the way to the top? She says, all right, he says, you brought it back to him. So I brought her. He says, now I want you to walk around this entire worship center with that glass of water. And don't you spill any of it. He says, she walked all the way around it. He says, how'd you do? She said, I didn't spill a drop. He says, did you see anybody else in the in the worship center while you were doing that? She says, no, I was concentrating on this glass of water. He says, how about next Sunday you come up here and you concentrate on the message like you concentrate on that water? Mm. Oh. She, she came back the following Sunday. She never talked about leaving again. He says, a lot of folks that come in here, they, they got a monkey on their back, and they're so busy wrestling that monkey the entire time they're in the church, they don't hear anything. And I can't tell you the number of times when I first started coming to church before I got saved, that preacher won't talk to me. He was talking to a person beside me, behind me, or in front of me. Because you're always thinking, that's for them. That ain't for me. And every single message for each and every one of us. I tell, I've told people before, when I get up there and start preaching, it may as well be a six-foot mirror just on the other side of that pulpit because I'm talking to myself. There was a couple of times I came to church and I had my, I mean, obvious brogans on. People said, what in the world are you doing wearing them with a suit? And I said, I feel like sometimes i got to wear steel toes. I'm stepping on my toes as much as I'm stepping on y'all's. <laughs> Verse 14, for they say such things, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire better a better country that is in heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city and it's up to us to tell other folks about Jesus Abraham was telling everybody who called him from Ur to go to this promised land. He didn't know what was going to happen, how it was going to happen. All he knew is that God promised him that his seed would number more than the uh, stars in the sky. Now, he never saw that with his own eyes. He only had two boys that we know of, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was not of the promise. 
Ishmael was of the flesh, from Hagar. And Isaac didn't see it either. He had uh, Esau and Jacob. Jacob saw 70-something. But it wasn't until the 480 years after Abram left, uh, left Ur that we read about hundreds of thousands of people leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land. And they've been, they've, you know, no matter how many people in the earth have been trying to decimate the Jews, you can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it. They're, they're apple of God's eye. Some of them have tried to eradicate oh, yeah. the tribe. Yeah. Stalin did worse than uh, Hitler did. Hitler, yeah. Stalin. Hitler. I mean, Hitler killed six million of them, and Stalin killed 20 million. But, uh, and who knows how many other billions and billions have been killed by other folks we don't even know about. But, uh, I can say to God's people by faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son and there once again we see a shadow of the gospel of Jesus Christ how God so loved his world that he gave his only begotten son y'all know it's John 3 16 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Remember what I was saying earlier? Isaac was born from a dead womb. Sarah had already gone through menopause. Her womb was dead. He was no longer cycling every month. That's why she laughed when God said she's going to have a child in the season. Why wouldn't she? She's already gone through all of that stuff. She hasn't she hadn't had to deal with, you know, having to clean up and having to purge herself. Because remember, as a Hebrew woman, she hasn't had the law yet. But once Moses comes along, there's a Levitical law of what a woman's supposed to do after she goes through that every month and goes before the priest with a sin offering because of that purge of blood that happens when a woman goes through that cycle. Sarah hadn't dealt with that for decades. And then you got Isaac being born out of a dead womb. Once again, just like you see Jesus coming out of that dead tomb. Just as Abraham believed Isaac was going to come from a tomb if he went through what God told him to do. Because I want I want y'all to think about. Yeah, you know, I've had people tell me, said, "Well, Abraham knew that God was going to go ahead and give him a a, a lamb because he said so when he got ready to go up on Mount Moriah." Isaac said, "Father, we had the." The, we had the, the, uh, the fire and we got the kindling where's the sacrifice he said the Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice now people say well see he done it because they found a ram up there he didn't find a, a lamb up there he found a ram Abraham was prophesying what was going to take place when Jesus died on the cross because there's a big difference a huge difference between a ram and a lamb I don't know how many of y'all been close to sheep, particularly grown-up male sheep. There's a huge difference between a lamb and a ram. And if anybody knew what it was, a shepherd like Abraham did. But he went up there. Even though God had promised him from thy seed, the seed of the promise, which was the one that came through Sarah's womb, was going to number like the stars in the sky. He still took him, knowing that even if I go through with this, even if I bury him, God's going to bring him back from the dead because he promised me this boy's seed is going to be like the stars in the sky. And God didn't even have him go through it. He raised that knife up and said, hold your hand, Abraham. I know you won't keep your son, even your only begotten son, from me. And he turned around and looked, and there's that ram stuck in the thicket. Hmm. I've had so many people tell me, say, what kind of God do you follow that would have a man kill his own son? I said, did he? He was just proving him. Oh, that's a temptation. Nope. It would have been a temptation. It would have been from the devil. But that's just proving him. That's just God being God. It's like me loving my son the way as much as I love him. Not to where I would sacrifice him. But knowing when I took him to T-ball, you know, Bobby would go up there. He says, Dad, I don't want to get up there. I'm going to embarrass myself. I said, like, son, go ahead up there. Play like you played with me. Because I knew that boy could knock it over the fence over to second base. At Southeastern Elementary, he could do that when he was a little kid. But sometimes he'd just get all, he'd look around, get all nervous, and he'd hit the T-ball the holder instead of the ball. 
I said, that's all right. Just concentrate. Look at the ball. You don't have to look at the pitcher. He's not throwing it. It's right there on that tee top. One day he got off a good swing, and that thing went phew. Back then, he had a rule. You couldn't run but the second base. You couldn't, it couldn't be called a home run. But that's all right. He was down there, second base, just dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I hit the ball, and it went over the fence, and they can't find it. They had to get a new one. Yeah, he was tickled to death. I was too, but I already knew he could do it. And see, when God gives you a, a test like that, he already knows you can do it. If anybody knows, he does. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Now notice it said Jacob before Esau, even though Esau came out first. In verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the second born. They were twins, but they weren't identical twins. Jacob was fair. Isaac was rough, hairy, redheaded. He was gnarly. He had to have been gnarly. They put goat fur on that boy. His mama put goat fur on Jacob. Isaac reached out and grabbed his arm and said, There's Esau. That's a hairy boy there. I mean, I got some hair on my arm, but it don't feel like no goat, goat <laughs> fur. Uh. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. And he did them the same way Isaac did Jacob and Esau. He did them in reverse. Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, at the time that Joseph died, he was second command in the known world. Why would he think they'd ever leave? But God had obviously given him a prophecy of what was going to take place. Because he didn't say, if y'all leave, he says, when y'all leave. You take my bones, you bury them in the cave in Mamre next to my daddy's. And they took them. They took them. By faith, when Moses, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Because at that time, if a male child was to be born, the uh, midwives were to throw them in the river Nile. And I don't know if y'all have ever seen any uh, videos of the river Nile, but when things fall in there, they got these big old things actually named after the river. They're called Nile crocodiles. I imagine it became a feeding zone up there as many babies got thrown out there. Yeah, when you study the Bible, People are going to look at you funny, too, and see you as kind of judgmental. I've just got to tell you a little story here. <clears throat> this past June, we went to the Sight and Sound Theater. We really love going to that thing because it's just uh, it's just great to go watch the show. But if they don't stick to the Bible, it irks me. And when Moses' mama put him in that ark, instead of placing him among the reeds like the Bible says she did, because if you put them in among the reeds, crocodiles are out there where they can get around better because they're big. You put them in those thick reeds, he's not going to go anywhere and nobody will see him. But they showed her taking him on out into the river and all of a sudden, you know, they do these little special effects and you could see it from where we were at because we're up in the balcony and they hooked it up to this thing and it just went on up into the sky. That, that's nothing like what happened. She took him in and put him in among the reeds because when Pharaoh's daughter came out there after they'd done that, they heard a baby or found a baby. I don't know if he was crying or not, doesn't say. But uh, she sent one of her handmaidens over there and brought her back and said it's a Hebrew child. Now, a lot of people say it's a Hebrew child because of what kind of blanket it had on her. It's circumcised. Exactly. Didn't know, not, Egyptians didn't circumcise themselves. Circumcision is a covenant with Abraham. And so uh, they knew it was a Hebrew child. 
And it was proof of him being a Hebrew his entire life because you don't fix that. By faith, when he was come to years, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, he was 40 years of age when he done that. Raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He could have, you know, one of my brothers who may be here in another couple of weeks, he was telling me, he says, you know, Pastor, when, uh, when, uh, Ceausescu was executed. 23 of us, 23 of us, one for every million that was in the nation of Romania were picked to go to America and go to college and come back and bring the learning and stuff that we had learned while we were over there. He said, many of them didn't come back. And he said, I don't blame them. They went to America and America's land of milk and honey. And things have gotten a lot better in Romania than they are today, but, uh, there's nothing over there worth me moving over there. We got it too good over here. I mean, I love going over there and doing ministry and stuff like that. Quite frankly, if I were to go over there with my pension and, and retirement and stuff like that, I could live like a millionaire. And the only thing that costs a lot of money over there, of course, is taxes and their, and their, uh, their petroleum. But to buy a house, to buy property, it's nothing compared to it. It's, it's like what it was here back in the 1970s. It's that cheap. But uh, it, it's rough. First, first I had to relearn a whole new language, which if, I guess I could do it in a year or two, maybe, maybe three. I'm older now; it might take me four. And I got over there. Hannah's pretty good at it, but there was two Romanian ladies talking to her at the same time. The Sunday we had the the uh, uh, building dedication, and she just said, "When?" <laughs> and I could see it. She was trying to pick up on both of them, and it's still a new language to her. She gets really tired. And the, the guys that come over here and, and, uh, and, and preach at our church, they'll tell me after being in America for about three or four days, their head starts hurting. They start getting headaches because they're constantly translating in their head what they're hearing and what they're going to say because they're not speaking in their native tongue. Mm -hmm. And so Hannah's still doing that. She's gotten really good with the language. You know, I had her translate for me a few times on that day that we were out there cleaning up the church uh, church grounds that Friday before the building dedication. But uh, but when, when people would start over talking to each other, she'd get, N -n 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 -n. and she'd say in Romanian one at a time. I, I can't translate both of you at the same time. It's too much. You know, it's like uh, what was the computer would say, too much input. You know, people sit there and keep clicking on their computer when it's not responding. I'll tell them, stop doing that. You're just giving it something else to do, and it's not going to do it. The last 20 things you told it until it catches up. And that's where she was at. She had a reboot. <laughs> reboot. Yeah. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And you'll see uh, the, the uh, principle of first, uh, 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 first mention. A lot of times when you see where the uh, men who were chosen by God to go off and do things, when Abraham went to Egypt, it was a shadow of us falling back into our sinful nature. When Isaac went into Egypt, it's a shadow of us falling back into our sinful nature. And so when, when we look at uh, uh, Moses being in Egypt, Egypt is pictured as a shadow of sin. And so instead of the pleasures of sin for a season, living as an Egyptian, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now you say, how did he ever have, what, what, what are you talking about? Because what he did is he killed a guy, he found out that people knew about it, so he ran to the other side of the desert before Pharaoh found out about it and had him killed. Well, when he was on the other side of the desert is when he met God in that burning bush and realized who God was. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And this is something we really need to concentrate on as Christians. Verse 27 is a good one for somebody to place, everyone to place in, uh, in, their, in their memory banks. We need to believe in God and follow him as in seeing someone who is invisible. Because he truly is God. He truly is who he says he is. We're not just reading a fairy tale book when we read the Bible. We're reading something that's truth. We're reading something about the way, the truth, and the life. And so when you, when you live as Moses did, Moses is called the most meek man on earth. Yet he's not weak, he's meek. 
There's a big difference between meek and weak. Moses is obviously a strong man. He killed a guy with his bare hands. He led thousands and thousands of stiff-necked and stub stubborn people for 40 years without killing one of them. God did to kill them, but he didn't kill any of them. But the fact of the matter is, you know, that, that there's a big difference between weak and meek. Moses was willing to, to, uh, to believe as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, the same to do, were drowned. Now, a lot of people miss this point because I, uh, there are actually books written about this to help people learn about the Bible. People just need to read the Bible. There was a, a book put out by Lifeway back in the 80s or 90s. It's called Step by Step Through the Old Testament. In that book, it taught that the Egyptians and the Hebrews walked through a place that was kind of marshy and the wet water was only about 18 inches deep. And when I told the minister of education who wanted me to teach that book, I said, I'll teach this book, but I'm going to go through and find everything wrong with it. We're going to call it uh, a class in, uh, in discernment. Step by step through the Old Testament through a flawed book. And that's what I'm going to call it if you want me to teach it. If not, find somebody else. And when I told him what was wrong with it, he, you know, he was going to try to change it out real quick. I said, no, no, let's teach people how to discern what's right and what's wrong. Not by a book they pick up at a so-called Bible bookstore, but by the Bible itself. Let's teach people how to figure out what's right and what's wrong according to God's Word. And so when we got to that point, they said, well, it's feasible that they could have done that, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's feasible, but that just makes God's uh, uh, miracles that much greater. And they said, well, how's that? I said, how did, he do, how did he drown Pharaoh's army in 18 inches of water? But let's go back to what the Bible says. The Bible says that, that God blew the water. It's not like what he did when Joshua went across the Jordan River and it got pushed back 20 miles north all the way to the city of Adam. No, in, 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 in Moses' case, the water parted on both sides, and it says there was a wall on both sides. And when they walked down through it, it wasn't wet, it wasn't muddy, it was dry ground. And then when Pharaoh's army started coming through, you know, we always see these things in the movies where, oh, here comes Pharaoh's army, and they all start running. They had already got off on the other side when God relieved, lifted up his pillar of fire and then Pharaoh's army started going. When Pharaoh's army started going through there, now all of a sudden it's wet. And, it's, and the chariots are getting stuck. And everything's in the disarray. And all of a sudden, God tells Moses, all right, raise your, raise your staff again. And them two walls just go. Well, Pharaoh's army just washing around Last time anybody from Israel saw an Egyptian is when they floated up on the banks of the, of the Red Sea. They were dead. Horses, chariots, riders, everybody. They are gone. But yet this book said that they walked through 18 inches of water. And people read that and they say, well, I never thought about that. Well, you shouldn't have had to because that's not what it says in the Bible. And that's just one of the mess-ups they had in that book. Let's see what my time is. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And there have been people that have been trying to come up with a, a natural reason why that happened. <laughs> God told Moses, he said, I want you to gather all the people. I want you to gather all the, all the priests. I want you to gather all the... All the folks, all of the, the sons of Levi, I want you to gather the, the Gershonites, the Kareites, the Marayites. These are all the guys that carried all the stuff and everything later on when they built the tabernacle. He says, I want you to gather all these folks together, and I want you to gather them all up, and we're going, we're, I want you to walk around the city. He says, I want you to compass that thing. We're going to compass, and compass, compass means compass. Compass has got 360 degrees. I want you to circle that entire city. Now, of course, he told them to do it the right way. You do it outside of the archer's range. He said he walked outside of the archer's range all the way around that city one time. Went back to camp. Come back the second day, walked all the way around there. Went back to camp. Now, you know them people in Jericho looking at these people said, what in the world? They ain't doing a thing. They're just walking around. Were they looking for some kind of flaw in the, in the wall? Are they looking for, what's the issue here? 
Imagine the seven day when they come out there, they're probably bringing snacks with them now and a cold drink. Hey, look, here they come again. They do that circle when they get around that uh, end of that circle, they blow the trumpet <laughs> and the wall falls down. <laughs> I imagine that was really surprising for the ones that were on that wall. <laughs> and God is so good at the at the, the, the little minuscule things that we don't think about. Because guess who lived on that wall? Rahab. Rahab. It won't the one she lived on. If it had been, her and her family would have died. Yeah. Spies told her, says, you stay inside of this house. You're going to save your family. But anybody outside this house, their blood's on their hands. They stayed inside that house. When everything was done, they went up there and said, here's the lady that let us come through here. Y'all wanted you to be a Jew? Sure do. Come on. Now Rahab is great, 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 great grandmama of David. She's a harlot. Yet God can use anybody. He wants to use. Now, I've had people tell me, now, if Rahab a harlot can be an ancestor of Jesus, why can't a man who's running around with another woman still be a pastor? Doesn't say Rahab was a pastor. She was a professional. <laughs> there's no rules for being an ancestor of Jesus. There's not. Now, there's a rule for how far down the family tree it could be before a, a bastard could be a uh, could sit on the on the uh, on the uh, throne of the king, an illegitimate child, because that's what a bastard is. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, you're saying a bad word." That's what it means. You know, it's like when you read the King James Bible, you read the word "ass." It's talking about a type of donkey, and so. People ask me, he says, why did Saul, why was Saul on the throne of, of, of Jerusalem? Why, why did he sit on the throne before David did? I said, because they hadn't called, they were on the ninth generation. Because see, Judah had a child through his daughter-in-law after a couple of his sons died. Y'all know that story? Mm -hmm. After his sons died and everything, yeah. he's, he, he's, uh, he, he goes off and, and he, sees, uh, he sees her playing the part of a harlot. And he brings her into his house, has her. She says, I, I, I need, if, if you're going to do this with me, I want your staff and I want your signet ring. Okay. Gives it to her and, and fathers a child. They come to him and say, uh, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. Really? Bring her before me. We're going to have her stoned to, stone to death. What have you got to say for yourself? She says, the father of this child, this is his ring and this is his staff. And you know what Judah says? She's more honorable than him. Exactly. She's more honorable than I am. Because she did what she was supposed to do. He was supposed to give his next son to her, but he was afraid that son was going to die like the other two had. And because of that, a child of Judah was born illegitimately. And so now, according to Levitical law, no illegitimate child can sit on the throne of David to the 10th generation. Saul was the last generation that couldn't. Jesse was the last generation that couldn't sit on the throne. Once David came, then you could have one of the line of Judah sit on that throne. And it's neat when you find these things out because people say, well, Okay, the first king was of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, that was probably just because, it, come up with all the reasons you want to. Here's why it wasn't of the tribe of Jesse. Because that generation wasn't there yet. And if you just read the Bible, it, it, it explains all this stuff. It's, it's just cool how God's Word does that. Huh? How it messes together. Yeah, it does. Let's see. I think Rahab and her her husband they had a Obed and Obed had a, had Boaz and and Boaz. You know what he was before he met his wife, don't you? Bo Boaz was Ruth. Boaz had Obed. But what was Boaz before he met his wife? He was ruthless. <laughs> I couldn't help myself, folks. <laughs> I was like, okay, is he is he being serious? Or 
I got to do that every now and then, folks. Y'all just take me too seriously. <laughs> That's why I said that, so you'd be thinking about, oh, man, wait a minute, that was Ruth and Boaz's son. <laughs> so you had, you had Boaz, you had Obed, you had Jesse, and you had David. I love it. So Ruth wasn't really a Jew before. She wasn't a Jew. She, she was a Moabite. She was a Moabite. Moabite. Yeah. But yet, even though she had left her people and married one of Naomi's sons after Naomi's husband died and both of her sons died, when she told her two daughter-in-laws, y'all need to go back to your people because she was just in so much depression, uh, Ruth says, I, I'm, I, I'm going to stay with you until, until your last breath. She really, so for some reason or other, God had placed a, a love in, in her heart for her mother-in-law that she would not leave her. And because of that, you know, Naomi ended up uh, seeing her Moabite daughter-in-law become a daughter of promise though she didn't know about it until later on when she saw it in heaven because her and Boaz have Obed who has David and is called the line of David the seed of David that Jesus sits, sits upon even though Jesus is David's Lord and people look at that and say, how do you keep all that stuff in your head? If you study God's Word enough, it just becomes second nature to you. It's like studying algebra or, or calculus, stuff like that. People tell me, say, I don't understand. You know, why in the world do they put letters in, in the math? You know, that just messes me up. Well, that's, that's what you do with math. You take, you take unknown quantities and you try to figure out stuff like that. You know, contractors don't just walk out on the job and say, okay, I need X number of square feet or square yards of concrete when I pour this pad. They got to measure the thing out. They got to figure out uh, uh, length times width times height, and uh, and then sometimes you got to kick in a, an angle there, which throws everything off. And so you got to figure out how to do that. And if you break it down into a right triangle, then you got a square plus b square equals c square, which is a hypotenuse of the triangle. And I know I'm getting too far ahead of a lot of people, but as you learn this stuff, it makes what you do as a, as a, for a living, because this is what I used to do for a living. Well, now this is what I do for a living. I teach God's Word. I preach the Word. And so I'm going to spend time in the Word. You know, I had a guy I told me one time, he says, I don't get this. When you preach to me, uh, um, uh, you was at, he says, you came to my church and you preached a funeral and you never had to go open God's Word and yet you said all these words. I said, no, 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 no. Don't you compare me to another pastor. That's how he does it. This is how I did it when I worked with Vepco. When I worked for Vepco, I'd go out and work on a breaker. Before I'd go out and work on a breaker, I'd take that book home the night before. They weren't paying me to do that. But I wanted to know what I was doing because I didn't want to hurt myself, and I didn't want anybody else I was working with to get hurt. So I'd take that book home, and I'd study, what am I going to work on on that thing? And sometimes I'd take that thing back to work the next morning, get there early, not on their time but on my time, and I'd make some copies of some pages. And I'd highlight some things so I could remember and not forget that and put it in my own notebook so when I was doing the work, I could do that. But by about the second or third time I worked on that breaker, I didn't need that instruction book anymore. Eventually, as a pastor, there are some things you can do without breaking out the instruction book because you know it. If you don't know it after using it all the time, there's something wrong with you. You know, one of the things that concerns me, I want to stay a pastor as long as I live. But eventually, this church is going to have to find somebody else because my mind's not as good as it used to be. I wish I knew Scripture like I used to know it. There's so many times now I'll go to say a Scripture and i say, let's go see what God's Word says. The reason why I'm doing that is because, quite frankly, I'm not sure how Word starts. Or maybe I've forgotten what the address is or something like that. And it's not because I don't remember it, because I remember it comes to my mind, but my mind's just not as sharp as it used to be. And you know, one day, and I'm hoping before it gets too far, somebody's going to reach the shepherd's crook out of the side of the stage and yank me out of the stage right. Don't let somebody stay up there and just, you know, that man doesn't even know how you get to heaven anymore. But yeah, we sure like having him up here. He's been up here 70 years now. Just Let's see how long we can keep one. No, 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 that's not what you want to do. You want to find somebody that preaches the Word of God, believes in the Word of God, and wants to see people saved. You don't, you don't just keep people up there because you want to see how long you can keep them. But uh, let's see, we got five more minutes. Where did I stop at? We're going to go ahead and stop right there, Rahab. We'll go ahead and pick up in verse 32 next time. That way y'all can get there on time for uh, far. Next week we're going to pick up in verse 32. Verse 32. And I don't know what's going on with this thing. Uh, for figure this thing out, I might have to swap swap phones next time. Y'all got any questions? What verse are we gonna pick up on next week? Thirty-two. All right.
I love it. Y'all been listening. I got it now, but I won't have it next time we yeah. come together. <laughs> I tell you something I love, especially when parents bring kids to church. I had a, a couple that brought their kids. They had four beautiful daughters. And now I think they may all be graduated high school by now. I don't know. They were little. And every single time when they come to see me, they, they tell me how many times I either say Jesus, Christ, saved, tomb. You know, the, the parents would give them certain words to listen for. And so they would listen for those words instead of sitting there fiddling around or drawing on the envelopes and stuff like that. And that is so cool to me that parents would do that with their kids. And the kids would tell me how many times I'd say it. And there were times I'd go back and look because you know, I, I did this years ago just to bring it back to my professor and let him critique me and, uh, when, I was, when I was preaching on Sunday mornings. And, uh, oh, man, he'd hit that thing with a red pen, some kind of bad. But uh, I'd, I'd go back and listen to us. and Man, this kid's hit every one of them. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple of times the numbers was off, but I mean, most of the time they were dead on. They were listening. And I look at that and I think, wow, how many of us adults are doing that? Hmm? That was an awesome concept. It really was. It really was. Instead of giving the kids a phone and saying, all right, go ahead and play your game, just make sure you got the volume down low. Because I look out there sometimes, like people can't, when we don't have children's church, and I'll see that kid's face all lit up, I know that's a screen in front of them. It's hard to miss that. <laughs> if you're, and, oh, that's just that's just a daily glow. No, it isn't. They got a phone in front of them. <laughs> I went when I had the children when they were younger. I always sat on the second row because if they're close, then they can hear better. Mm -hmm. They pay better yeah. attention. Because when I would sit in the back, they were all squirmy and mm -hmm. everything. So I sat up front with the kids. There you go. They, be careful, you might get a pass and say, hey, 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 go sit over there by your mama. <laughs> I found out a long time ago, you can get a lot of trouble with a parent by doing that, one, even when it's your own kid. <laughs> one of the pastors pointed out, he says, let the little children come first. There you and go. They started having children's church, which mm. I was not as enamored of. I don't like, I don't like having children. Children, I, I, children's church to me has its pros and cons. Jerry loves what she does with the kids in children's church, but uh, I think the kids need to learn at an earlier age, you know, how to sit down and listen. And uh, a lot of times we have to do children's church because, quite frankly, as parents don't teach them how to sit down and listen. Mm -hmm. So we need uh, to do schools. Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, when we t we took our kids out, you know, my. I, I'll tell you this story, I'm going to let you go. Uh, we were at a store one day, and uh, this kid was just going off. I mean, he was squalling. He was falling down on the floor and kicking and screaming. He was yanking stuff off the aisles, and, and we ended up getting right behind them when we went through the uh, cash register. And Bobby's just standing right there next to me, and he's about six. I think it was his first year of school, so he was six years old. And we're walking on out there and, and uh, going to my truck. And he says, Dad, I think I know why you make me listen. Now, you don't hear that from your kids many times. Sometimes we never do. And it could go either way. So all of a sudden, I'm, you know, I got the radar on right now. I, I look at him and I say, uh, why do I make you listen, son? He says, that kid that was in front of us in line, people didn't like him. And you don't want people to feel like the way towards me. I said, let's go back in the store, son. He said, what for? I said, uh, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what else could you do as a daddy? You know, I was going to get that boy ice cream or candy bar, whatever he wanted. I mean, I wasn't going to buy him everything in the store, but... That that was that 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 meant something to me. Mama's goats. Yeah. <laughs> that that was amazing to me. Yeah. <laughs> Father God, we just thank you so much for this time in your word. We pray that you will bless it according to who you are, that we may be able to use it on that day when we're in needing to do it. Because there's so many things that we want to just apply so many rules and regulations to when it comes right down to it, we're just here to please you. So Father, teach us how to please you. But we know it's in your word. In Jesus' name we pray this in all things. Amen. Amen.